Hello, here's your video on 9.7 probability. So after you're done watching the video, you should be able to find the probability of certain events. So the first thing we're going to look at is very simple probability. So it's the number of favorable outcomes divided by the total number of outcomes. The notation you'll see is P of E. Um, so find the probability of rolling a 4 on a dice. So that's the probability of a 4 on a dice. Well, how many ways can you get a 4 on a dice? Well, there's one way to do that. Out of how many options do you have on a dice? 6. So your probability of rolling a 4 is 1 sixth. Alright, probability of rolling an even. Well, how many ways can you get an even number on the dice? Well, you have 2, 4, 6, so that's 3 out of how many options? 6. So your probability of rolling an even is 1 half. Alright, let's spice up the probability a little bit. So now you're rolling two die. What is the probability that the sum is less is seven and the sum is less than nine? So now I'm looking at two dice and taking those numbers after I roll them and add them together. So what I need to do is I need to figure out um, all of my possible outcomes. So here's dice number one. So dice number one, I have one, two, three four, five, six numbers that can occur when I roll it. And dice number two, same thing. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then from there, I need to look at all of my sums. So what I'm doing right now is I'm creating this table of outcomes. Because that'll tell me all of the different sums I would get when I roll these two die together. So for example, when I roll a 1 and a 1, it gives me a 2. A 1 and a 2 gives me a 3, and so forth. So I'm going to go ahead and fill in the table. I'm going to keep filling in the table. Oh, forgot that random box over there. 2 plus 3 is 5. <laughs> okay, so those are all the different sums that I can get when I roll the dice. So what is the probability that the sum is 7? So I'm looking at all of my ways that I can get a sum of 7. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 ways to do that. So that is 6 out of how many total ways do we have? And that's 36. So that's 6 out of 36, which is 1 sixth. What is the probability that the sum is less than 9? So less than 9 would be 8 or below. So that's looking at all of these numbers. So every single number that is less than 9. Now, that's a lot of numbers to actually count. So instead of doing the numbers that are less than 9, how about we look at the numbers that are 9 or greater? So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So I have 10 numbers that are 9 or greater, so that means 26 of them are less than 9. So that's 26 out of 36, which is 13 eighteenths. So what I did just now is use the complement instead of actually finding the sum that's less than 9. I went ahead and did that was 9 and greater because I didn't feel like counting all of those other um, numbers. But either way, you still get the same probability. Alright, let's look at mutually exclusive or mutually inclusive events. So mutually exclusive events are events that cannot happen at the same time. Mutually inclusive events are events that can happen at the same time. So find the probability 
Oh, this should say just probability, not odds, because we're not doing odds. It's a typo from an old PowerPoint. Um, find the probability of picking a jack or a queen. Now, can you have a jack that is a queen? No, you can't. So these two are events that cannot happen at the same time. So those are mutually exclusive. So what I can do is I can find the individual probabilities and add them together because these are or probabilities. So the probability of picking a jack from a deck of cards is 4 out of 52. By the way, if you are not familiar with the standard deck of cards, I would Google it and start to study them because you'll see a lot of problems that deal with a deck of cards. And then a queen, there's four queens, again, out of 52. So the probability of picking a jack or a queen is 8 out of 52, which can be reduced. So don't forget to reduce your fractions. That's 2 thirteenths. So these two are mutually exclusive events because they can't happen at the same time. Uh, for part B, picking a spade or an ace. Now, can you have an ace of spades? Yes, you can. So that is mutually inclusive, where events can happen at the same time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the individual probabilities first. So the probability of picking a spade is 13 out of 52, because you have 13 spades in a standard deck of cards. The probability of picking an ace is 4 out of 52. Now, how many aces of spades do you have? Well, you have one. So the overlap, you need to subtract. All right, so I have 13 plus 4 is 17 minus 1 is 16. So that's 16 out of 52, which can be reduced to 4 thirteenths. So if you do have an event that can occur at the same time, you just need to subtract whatever that overlap is. And since there is one ace of spade, we subtracted the one out of the 52. Okay, independent events are and probabilities, where the outcome of one event does not affect the other event. So what is the sample space of rolling a dice and flipping a coin? Find the probability of rolling a three on a dice and flipping tails on a coin. So I have my sample space of rolling a dice and flipping a coin. So it's just telling you the different ways that you can roll a dice and flip a coin. So I can roll a dice that gives me one through six. And flipping a coin is heads or tails. Okay. Find the probability of rolling a three on a die and flipping tails on a coin. So rolling a three on a dice is one out of six. And flipping tails on a coin, so flipping tails on a coin is one half. And since these are and probabilities, I can go ahead and multiply these two together. And these are independent events because rolling the dice has zero effect on flipping a coin. So your probability of rolling a three on a dice and flipping tails on a coin is one twelfth. All right, this last, this last example of probability is a little more complicated because you're incorporating probability with combinations. So a class is given a list of 20 study problems from which 10 will be part of the upcoming exam. So there's 20 questions on the test review, and 10 of them will be on the test. If a student knows how to solve 17 of the problems, find the probability that the student will be able to correctly answer all 10 questions. Okay, so the student is answering 10 questions, and they know how to answer 17 of them. So what we're looking at is we're looking at, we're looking at a combination. So of the 17 questions, that the student can answer, or that the student knows, he needs to answer all 10 questions correctly. So he knows how to do 17, and he needs to answer 10 of those questions. And that is out of the 20 questions that are on the review, 
and they're choosing 10 of them for the test. So here's the combination that you're working with, and we can use a calculator to figure those out. So that's 17 choose 10, which is 19448 over 20 choose 10, which is 184756. Let's see if that can be reduced. Two nineteenths. So the probability that they can answer all ten questions is two nineteenths. Now that doesn't really tell us much in terms of, you know, because two nineteenths is an odd fraction. Um, but let's look at a percent. So two nineteenths is 0 0.105, which is about 10.5%. So it makes a little more sense to look at that as a percent when we're talking about this in the context. So the probability that they can answer all 10 questions correct when they know 17 of them is only 10%. That doesn't seem very good. Um, but letter B, exactly find the probability that the student will be able to correctly answer exactly seven questions on the exam. So answering exactly seven questions is a little more complicated. So out of the 17 questions that they know, they want to answer 17 or seven questions correctly. But there's still three more questions on the test. So they've already answered seven questions. So that means out of the 17, there's 10 left. And then there's two, or there's 10 left. And then there's three left for them to answer because they could only answer um, seven out of the 10 questions. So there's three questions that they don't answer correctly. And they know how to answer 17 of them. And since they've already used up seven of them, that gives us that 10 for the second combination. And that's over all of the different ways that he can possibly answer the questions, which is 20 choose 10. I realize that I set up one of these combinations wrong, so let me start, let me backtrack a little bit. So he can answer exactly seven questions on the exam correctly, and the student knows how to solve 17 of them. So this first, this first one is good. Let me erase this one. because that one was incorrect. So he knows how to answer 17 questions, so he's gonna get seven of those questions correct. And then on the test, or when he was reviewing, there was three questions that he didn't know how to answer. So the second combination would be the questions that he doesn't know how to answer. And there's three questions that he doesn't know how to answer, and there's three more questions on the test, so that's three choose three. Sorry about the confusion. And then that denominator is the 20 choose 10 because there's 20 questions on the review and they're choosing 10 questions for the test. Okay, let's put that in the calculator. So I have 17 choose 7 times 3 choose 3, which is 19448 over 20 choose 10 184756 I just realized it gave us the same answer as letter A which is fine so 2 nineteenths also known as about 10.5% so the probability of answering all 10 questions correctly is about 10.5%, and the probability of getting exactly seven questions on the exam correct is the same probability. That's just a coincidence. It does not happen every single time. All right, so that is the end of your probability notes.